Thank you, Your Honor. Attorney Neil Agarwal on behalf of the mother, uh, Kayla Willimack. Uh, I'll reserve five minutes for Attorney Ferguson uh, as co-counsel. Your Honor, facts of this case, while extensive and long, are not in any real serious dispute. There was a filing uh, by Summit County Children's Services back in August of 2013. The agency eventually filed for permanent custody, which was granted by this court, which was, or which was granted by the juvenile court, and then it was reversed by this court. The day after the court issued, this court issued its decision, mother and one of the fathers who had previously relinquished in the middle of the permanent custody filed a motion to vacate their relinquishment of parental rights and filed a motion that because the, the, the kids have been in, in temporary custody of the agency in excess of two years, the court has to either place the children outside of the temporary custody of the agency or dismiss and refile a new uh, DN complaint. The judge didn't take any evidence or hearing on those motions, but instead just issued a brand new permanent custody decision uh, changing the basis for the permanent custody. And that is, uh, and all parties have then reappealed before this court. Your Honor, I would cite on page four of my brief, 2151.415D4. This is a relatively new statute uh, created by the Ohio General Assembly. And it says that no court, and we're talking about the juvenile court here, shall, not, shall grant an agency uh, no more than two extensions of temporary custody, and the court shall not order an existing temporary custody order to extend beyond two years upon which the date uh, of the complaint was filed or placed into shelter care. It is upon this statute that the mother had filed a motion to either dismiss or place the child outside of temporary custody. The statute is plain on its face, and it is a legislative overruling of an Ohio Supreme Court decision previously made in 1996 called Inri Young. Henry Young was an Ohio Supreme Court case that says that in the absence of statutory authority, the juvenile court had authority to create temporary orders beyond two years. However, the legislature has since amended the statute to now create this subsection that says no conditions can the court go beyond two years. The, so I would argue, Your Honor, that because the statute is plain, once the two-year time limit has been met, the trial court, and it says the court cannot allow it, it is self-executing to go beyond two years. The, in this case, the state has argued that because no party requested the exercise of this statute upon the expiration of two years, and we're talking like two years in one day, that argument is forever waived and foreclosed to the mother, to the fathers, to the grandmother, and the children's services. So under that thinking, or that logic, if the parties don't file a motion to dismiss, basically at two years and one day, the trial court can keep the child in temporary custody from birth to 18. Let me ask you a question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but hypothetically, Well, the permanent custody filing does not conflict with the statute because the statute says that the child can't remain in temporary custody of the agency. So even if the agency files a motion for permanent custody, once that two years expires, the permanent custody can be held whenever. Right, well, my point but, is that if, when, when you set the time for the permanent custody trial, yes. if, if the dates are set beyond the two year time, wouldn't you as a the mother's attorney know that hey, the state's beyond the two years, we can file our motion to dismiss now because we know the state's not going to be heard until well beyond the two years? Uh, absolutely. 
But again, the statute doesn't require dismissal. The, the statute requires the child be removed from temporary custody of the agency. So even if a permanent custody is being held beyond the two years, that has nothing to do with where should the child be pending the permanent custody here. So is so that it's a, just the child just is put in the dangerous situation? I'm not talking about this one, I'm thinking hypothetically. A child is just removed from temporary custody and put in a dangerous situation, reverting back to the custody of the parents, for instance? There's well, no protection, there's no safety net there for the child? No, no. Uh, if a child has to be placed outside of the temporary custody of the agency, it could be temporary custody to a relative, it could be temporary custody to a parent, it could be uh, legal custody. I mean, there, the only thing that is prohibited under the statute is temporary custody to the agency. Other dispositional options are available with protective supervision, without protective supervision, but it says no more than two years of temporary custody to the agency. Well, there's only one permanent custody hearing. Uh, on day two of the hearing, mother and one of the fathers uh, told the judge, Your Honor, we've decided we want to relinquish permanent custody. The trial judge made a knowingly intelligent and voluntary colloquy with both the parties, and they, they agreed to voluntarily surrender their parental rights. There is no dispute that that's what happened, and my client, the mother, is not saying otherwise. However, after this court reversed the permanent custody, the very next day, she filed a motion, and so did the father, saying, we are withdrawing our with voluntary relinquishment, and we, if we're going to have a hearing, we want to be able to participate and contest the findings at the new hearing. The trial judge, again, did not take any evidence or make any findings on the motion other than deny it. You have already relinquished, and once you relinquish, you cannot vacate your relinquishment, in other words. Now, this court... In a decision uh, from 2015, INRI AP, 2015 Ohio 206, basically said, and that was a case where a father voluntarily relinquished during permanent custody. It was reversed because the grandmother was not made a party for other reasons. And then uh, the grandmother got legal custody and she wanted the father to pay child support. And there uh, the father said, I already relinquished. I don't have to pay child support, I'm, I'm done. And this court said, no, 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 that's not true. Once the permanent custody was reversed, your parental rights were reinstated as a matter of law. Now, uh, the state in this brief says, INRI AP is distinguishable on its facts because there the father relinquished under a wrong statute. However, I have the decision for me in front of me, and on page, uh, paragraph 22 of that decision, it says, in substance, Father's attempted voluntary surrender of his parental rights was not executed pursuant to 5103.15, but was instead consent to the ultimate 2012 permanent custody judgment. So it wasn't based upon an improper statute that he relinquished. He relinquished pursuant to the filing of permanent custody. And there they said, once this court reversed the permanent custody, he was still a father, he still had parental rights and obligations, and the trial court would have to retake away his permanent custody rights in a new decision. So we're... It sounds like he just conceded permanent custody. There's a difference between voluntary relinquishment and a concession of permanent custody, right? That can happen all the time. You just don't fight it. But you don't necessarily relinquish. Well, um, <clears throat> he surrendered... His, well, the, the wording is he surrendered his parental rights. So I would argue that's what the mom did in the middle of the PC and one of the fathers. They surrendered their parental rights to the agency. Once but the permanent custody was reversed in this case. It was simply the wrong statute that was applied when the decision was entered. That's a reversal. This court said right. the findings of the trial court's permanent custody is erroneous. Because and it's we're a 22 issue. But I guess my, my point is that it wasn't reversed because, um, and it didn't go back and say, okay, now we have to re-litigate this whole entire case. Which, in, in your case, when you talk about young, the permanent custody was reversed because the grandma was, it's a whole different set of facts. So it's really not, it, the, it's the, apples and oranges, really. Well, the facts are different. I, I don't think I'll ever get exact facts. Right. But the holding 
is that when this court reverses permanent custody, parental rights are reinstated. That is the holding that I'm applying to the facts of this case. When this court reversed the permanent custody based upon the erroneous findings of the trial court, the mother's and the other father's parental rights were reinstated as a matter of You're law. You're saying that even in, even in circumstances where there's voluntary relinquishment. Okay. Correct. Correct. there's not a voluntary relinquishment when you reverse the permanent custody, that's a completely different situation. Correct. And, in fact, mom, relin she said the day after the decision, we are withdrawing our voluntary relinquishment, so you can't rely on that anymore. So with that, Your Honor, I'd ask the court to reverse the remand, and I'll reserve the rest of the time for return. May it please the court, I'm here on behalf of the maternal grandmother. I want to um, talk about my two assignment of errors that differ from Attorney Agarwal. So we did join Attorney Agarwal on his assignment of error regarding the dismissal. In this case, my client did try to get legal custody. I did plead these arguments before, which is why I only asked for five minutes this time. Um, my client was there and allowed to intervene during the case as a full party. When Carrie Van Meter testified regarding the issues with my client, um, she stated several things. That my client was present when KT was drugged. The issue with that is they never told my client, CSB admitted, they never told my client that her daughter was using drugs. My client was told that her daughter was in treatment and not that she was testing positive. She was also told that she wasn't the one responsible for supervising visits. Her daughter, her oldest daughter was. Yet, her oldest daughter failed in this job and my client is paying the penalty for it because she was found not to have protected the child and she didn't have all the facts. She didn't recognize that this child was drugged. Well, the foster parents who undergo s several hours, 40 hours of specialized training every year, didn't realize it either quite a few hours after the child was returned to their care. But they held this against my client and say that the foster parents wanted to adopt and they were a proper household. Another thing they held against my client and they were very specific about was my client depersonified, depersonalized KT because she constantly referred to KT as the baby or her. I outlined in my brief every time the foster parent did that. And I actually asked the foster parent, the foster parent was actually asked, so you're depersonalizing this child. She said, no, that is common with more than one child that you call the youngest the baby. There's no depersonalization. They held that against my client, though. Another thing they held against my client was we didn't want her giving the children ice cream. And she did. The foster parent testified, we give the children ice cream all the time. They love it. But my client couldn't give the ch children ice cream because apparently there was a lactose issue. Another issue they held against my client, she didn't attend all the medical appointments. Though the foster parent testified she attended every single one I told her about. I didn't tell her about all of them because I didn't have time for her to come sometimes. My client did everything she possibly could, and yet it was held against her when she wasn't told information, when she wasn't allowed to participate, or when she treated the, her grandchildren the same way the foster parent did. But the foster parent was um, allowed to retain the children. And they were looking at the foster parent as an adoptive household for doing the same things that my client was doing, which allegedly were not in the children's best interest. I believe the trial court committed reversible error when they did not take that into consideration. The second thing I do believe they, the trial court committed reversible error on is the guardian ad litem. The guardian ad litem in this case used to work for Summit County Children's Services for several years. This is not a Rule 48 issue. I want to be very clear about that. Rule 48 is a guideline. However, the statute, 
RC 2151-281-I states, the guardian ad litem for an alleged or adjudicated abused, neglected, or dependent child shall perform whatever functions are necessary to protect the best interest of the child, including but not limited to investigation, mediation, monitoring court proceedings, and monitoring the services provided the child by the public children's services agency or private child placing agency that has temporary or permanent custody of the child. This guardian ad litem did no independent investigation. The statute requires that she shall do that. She is mandated to do that. The only investigation she did throughout <coughs> this entire case was talking to CSB, her former employer, and the foster mother. I thank you very much then, and I just ask that you reverse.